The NTSB has released its preliminary report on Tennessee Fly Girl's December 7th crash in her Beechcraft debonair. The report states that on December 7th, the morning of December 7th, she departed from Knoxville Downtown Airport, I believe that was her home base, en route for a cross-country flight to Benton, Arkansas, where she was going to get some avionics work from what was reported. Her initial climb was to 2,500 feet. After a few minutes, she climbed to 6,400 feet and got on flight following. So she was talking to somebody. Approximately 140 miles into the trip, ATC advised her that she was left of course. The pilot responded that she was correcting. Then 30 minutes into the flight, the airplane entered, entered into the first of a series of climbs and descents where the airplane's altitude varied between 6,400 feet and 5,300 feet. This went on for 40 minutes before entering a descent that stopped around 4,300 feet with an airspeed of 143 knots before climbing back up to 6,050 feet where the airspeed dropped down to only 85 knots. So she got pretty slow there at the top of that climb. If you look at the, at the FlightAware profile, you can see this. We discussed this on my last video. You know, this spent 40 minutes climbing and descending, and I believe at this point she was using the long cross country to try and figure out the autopilot, that Century 2000 autopilot that she had. She had been struggling with that for a lot of the flights in the debonair and probably using that time to figure that out. I don't think at that point, and again, this is pure speculation, she was having control issues because this went on for 40 minutes and she was on flight following. So at any point she was having that much trouble actually controlling the airplane, she probably would have contacted AC, ATC. After that uh, initial, that last climb up to 6,050 feet, the plane then descended rapidly before ADSB contact was lost in the vicinity of the crash site. During the last few seconds of the flight, the airplane reached a maximum ground speed of 228 knots and a maximum descent rate of 11,900 feet per minute. Now, that's really fast. 228 knots. Again, you remember, this is over the ground. In that steep of a dive, and probably about a 50-degree dive, reports have said, if you're doing... 228 miles an hour over the ground, your actual airspeed is much higher, probably close to 250 or more. I don't have the math for that, so I'm just guessing at this point, but either way, way over red line for the debonair. And almost 12,000 feet a minute, that's, that's cooking. During the altitude fluctuations, air traffic control twice provided instructions to contact Memphis ATC, but neither of those instructions were acknowledged. And during the final moments of the flight, there was a transmission that was heard with her end number, the words debonair, and a declaration of emergency. So at the final seconds in that final dive, she was declaring emergency. The report then goes on to describe the crash scene where she impacted a few trees before hitting the ground, leaving a debris field 800 feet long, 300, or 300 feet long, 8 feet wide, and 5 feet deep. A witness that I talked to stated the plane flew overhead at a high rate of speed and that the engine was running when it impacted the ground. They looked at the engine. They couldn't do compression checks on it because the cylinders were all disassembled from the engine. Same with the magnetos. But they didn't see any evidence of in-flight fire and marks on the propeller were consistent with the engine running at the time. Remember, there was a witness who reported hearing the engine that the engine was running. If the plane's doing... 228 knots minimum through the air, it's going to be loud enough in itself. So for you to be able to hear the engine over the top of the, just the wind noise that the plane is making, the engine was running. It was probably going full power. The flight control systems were all destroyed, so they couldn't be tested, but they were all in the vicinity of the crash site. So the plane hadn't broken up in flight, which is really a testimony to beach engineering. I mean, I would have, I'm shocked that a plane that's doing probably 250 knots airspeed at 12,000 feet a minute, didn't break apart in flight. I mean, that's one of the reasons I really like Beach. They're just solidly built. But everything was intact. They weren't able to test the control cables for functionality, but all the cables had broom straw brakes, that's where they split apart, that are consistent with impact-related separation, which basically means all the control cables were intact at the point of impact. So loss of control due to a cable snapping 
is at this point being ruled out. The elevator trim was measured and correlated to about a five degrees to about five degrees in the nose down direction. So it has a 10 degree nose down limit on the trim tab. So five degrees is about half. Pretty steep nose down deflection at that point. Uh, the wreckage, including two in, in, intact digital recording devices, were retained for further examination. So basically, she had two GoPros in the plane, and most likely they were running at the time because that was one of the main things she did when she was flying was make videos for YouTube. So the NTSB is going to be able to re report, you know, re take a look at those and report back exactly what happened. I mean, that's the, the beauty of having a GoPro on the plane. They, they can look and see exactly what went on. And on a side note, I wonder when airliners are going to do this. I mean, their cockpit voice data recorders are okay. They can hear what, hear what happens in the plane, kind of, sort of. And they can look at the engine parameters and the control inputs, but they don't have actual video of the crash. And, you know, for a $300 GoPro, GoPro sticky mounted to the top of the... <laughs> to the back of the bulkhead and I'd show the cockpit, they would be able to tell exactly what happened in every crash. So, of course, for them to do that, it would take a $10 million study and a $100,000 camera to do what a $300 GoPro would do, but that's just my two cents. <clears throat> so what does that leave us with? First of all, she was talking ATC. So carbon monoxide poisoning is probably being ruled out. I mean, they were at least conscious during the final moments of the crash because she made an emergency call. Now, it's possible that there was enough CO2 in there to make her woozy and affect her thought process, but that's probably not the case. Speculating point at past this point, beyond what I've already talked about in my previous video, is kind of pointless until we take a look at the video. I mean, before my, my original premises, she's having trouble with her autopilot. She's using it wrong. She's using the up-down button feature incorrectly and might have got into a really out-of-trim situation, which this does kind of point to at a 5 degrees nose-down trim. But who knows when that nose-down trim got in there. I mean, I'm, I guess it might have happened. You know, you come over the top of the dives, you're climbing uncontrolled, the plane was out of trim, too far nose back, she reaches down and spins that nose down aggressively to arrest the climb. And when it starts descending, she forgets about the trim and just tries to pull back. And so the entire way as the airplane's going faster and faster, she's just trying to pull it back by sheer muscle alone. And with that amount of nose down trim in the plane, plus the airspeed building up, so you build up the aerodynamic forces, making it harder and harder to pull out, and the longer you wait, the harder it is. That's a possible explanation. It seems weird that you wouldn't be able to pull out of a dive like that, uh, especially when you add in one final note that they put in the report, is that just before they lost track of it on ADSB, they had a transmission from the male passenger in the front seat, that was her father who was with her in the crash, and... He wasn't a rated pilot, and any kind of pilot at all, as far as I know. My guess is that he wasn't making a, a, a transmission. My guess is that he was got on the controls with her to help pull out of that dive, and in doing so, accidentally hit the transmit button, which is on the yoke. So what ATC heard that was unintelligible to them was just them trying to deal with the crisis in the cockpit. That's just a theory. I don't think he tried to help transmit on the radio to a matey, but I, I guess we'll find out when the NTSB issues their final report. But a couple of things, you know, number one, I think I mentioned it before, the, the throttle. Undoubtedly, she was going at full throttle the whole way down because the plane will not get going 12,000 feet a minute down at idle. Just isn't going to happen. Um, when I descent flying skydivers in the caravan, with the blade, you know, we bring the, the throttle to idle, essentially, and the blade's into flat pitch, so it's a, a lot of drag. And we'll get going down 6,000 feet a minute at our maximum, and that's cooking. You know, that's at idle. I mean, there's – and you're, the plane is in a pretty steep descent. You're literally hanging in your seatbelts. And for her to get going 12,000 feet a minute, that engine was producing power. Other thing is – this is now an off-the-wall theory of mine, but I wonder how tight her seatbelt was. And I mention that because 
If your seat belt is really loose and you come over the top of a steep climb and push it over and start your descent, you get a little zero G action going on the top and then when you start the descent, if your seat belt's not tight or your seat's not locked and you fall forward into the control column, you can't pull out of a dive. If you're all the way up against the instrument panel and you're up against the yoke, you can't pull out of a dive. And especially when you get into a descent, gravity is fighting against you. I know it sounds crazy and you're going to think that that could never happen. Well, I'm here to tell you it can because it happened to me early in my flying career. On one of my first three or four solo flights after soloing back in 1981, I left the pattern to go out and do some maneuvers and decided to get, I was getting cocky, I was the world's greatest pilot at that point, of course, and I decided to try that zero-G thing. You know, I built up a bunch of speed, came up really steeply, pushed it over the top, and started on the way down. And as soon as I did that, I fell forward into the control column because I didn't have my seatbelt on tight. Because again, this was back in 1981, and back then we didn't even wear seatbelts in cars, let alone in an airplane, oh, I guess I clicked it on just, just because, you know, you're supposed to wear a seatbelt. But I didn't really realize the three-dimensional aspect of airplanes when I started flying. And so I just had it on, and I didn't have it tight. And I fell into that control column as that 152 started to dive, and I could not pull out of it. I literally had to put one hand up against the instrument panel, push myself back up into my seat, let go of the control column, grab the seatbelt, tighten it down, and then pull out of the dive. And that story is in my book, Fairy Pilot, if you want to check out the whole thing of exactly what happened, because it, uh, it was an eye-opening experience. And let me tell you, I never flew with my seatbelt loose ever again. Anyway, those are my thoughts on that for right now. We're going to find out exactly what happened when the NTSB has time to take a look at the GoPro footage. I'm sure that will take care of everything unless of course her batteries are dead or they had it off which would be a shame because we'd really like to know what happened this is a weird one i still don't get it how someone can go from six thousand feet all the way to the ground in a dive and not be able to pull out of it it's i i hope we get to the bottom of this because it's it's strange anyway that's all i've got for now update on the queen air flight it's unfortunately not going to happen for a couple of reasons First of all, uh, when we did the final leak check before putting the cowlings back on, we found out that both engine-driven fuel pumps were leaking a little bit. That's something you really don't want to mess with, so we took those off and sending those in for overhaul. So it shouldn't take too long, but it's definitely not going to be done in time. And it probably wouldn't have mattered anyway because we're hard IFR here in Menominee today, and it looks like we're going to have... Rain and snow in the forecast for the next few days all the way through Christmas, so that wouldn't have been great flights for post-maintenance test flights or a Christmas flight with the family. So, unfortunately, I'm driving for Christmas. Anyway, that's <laughs> it is what it is. That's aviation. Got time to spare? Go by air. All right, well, you guys have a happy holidays and a Merry Christmas, and I'll see you next time. And remember, keep your speed up.